Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And I'm Paul. <laughs> hey, hey, we have another guest here. We have another guest. Uh, we have Paul Sohi here on the Minor Details podcast today. Yes, we do. Look at him. Yeah. You can on the YouTube. Yeah, check out the YouTube. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> Hi, um, podcast, I guess. Uh, we are three industrial designers, right? Yeah. Living in separate cities, but, you know, sweating small stuff. <laughs> Just trying to trying to work our tagline in there. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah thanks for coming on the podcast today thanks paul for having me um he paul is a product industrial designer at uh, autodesk and a fusion 360 evangelist not anymore but not, yeah not anymore not anymore okay what, what just do you... an industrial designer now i drop drop the evangelism uh, okay okay yeah. <laughs> so we thought paul, paul what are you doing here uh, I'm in town for uh, Core 77, um, doing a workshop on how to deal with objections from clients during the design process. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Should be fun. Yeah. How do you like the city? Uh, I It's a lot better than Boston. Okay. By the way, I'm putting that on record. All right. You heard it here first. <laughs> there yeah. goes our entire Boston fan base. All three of them. <laughs> uh, well, well, that's awesome. Um, I... I uh, am excited for the core conference, and James, you're coming too. I am coming. So we're going to come and hang out, and it's going to be Thursday, so I guess the time you're listening... Actually, I don't know when we're going to release this podcast. We're doing several interviews this week, (laughs) because there's a ton of awesome people coming for the Core Saving 7 conference. And so we're trying, yeah. to, we're trying to line them up and rack them out. And you guys have been begging for interviews, like in that poll you put up, which yeah. was like, do you yeah. just want it to be the two of us or do you want us to do interviews? Yeah, it was only one person said that they wanted the two of us. And then they messaged us and said, oh, I accidentally clicked the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, everyone doesn't want to hear our voices anymore. So, um, yeah, we were trying to bring on more yeah. people. So we sought out the most British person that we know because that's the kind of voice that people want to hear yeah. so all across this great choice. land, even <laughs> in the empires and the galaxies far, far away. They want that Brit. Yeah. Yeah. We've managed to evolve out of being the bad guys on everything now, which is nice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, <Long> <laughs> by the way. Um, well, Paul, I, I thought we'd just do a little quick backstory for those of you who aren't familiar with you and kind of hear, I don't know, I mean, you grew up in England, I assume? Yeah, yeah, born and raised in London. Okay. Um, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. So um, I always wanted to be an architect and I blame Lego, like fully blame Lego. Um, and then I went to university and I did it and I really enjoyed what I got to do at university and then I went out into the real world, and for six months, all I did was draw toilets. Like, oh. like literally, all I did was building Reg's drawings for poop. Wait, um, wait. So you, so you went to study architecture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm a liar. I'm sorry. I'm an industrial <laughs> designer, but only because I say so. Who is vetting <laughs> these people that we're interviewing? <laughs> Nick Baker. <laughs> oh man, I should have done my research. Uh, um, yeah. Well, well, wait. So, you, so you got a toilet design job after architecture school <laughs> yeah all right i mean like i'm i'm yeah i'm giving the exaggerated version we um yeah i went and worked at a design practice and like the way it goes it's the same with industrial design like you got to put in the grind at the beginning and i decided that i didn't want to yeah um you know how it goes i'm like mm-hmm. I'm too good for this. Like, I'm super smart. I don't need to draw toilets. <laughs> oh, no. Um, yeah, which went down super well. Um, so, yeah, I quit. And then I started up an industrial design company with uh, my business partner. And we focused on uh, 3D printing as an industry. So we made, like, aftermarket parts for uh, machines. We designed a few 3D printers. We were using the technology to, like, produce stuff at that scale. Um, what was the company called? Uh, 2052, which okay. really rolls off the tongue. 2052. Can, can I bring up something that I found in my research of you, oh God, Paul? Here, here we go. <laughs> uh, I found a Kickstarter. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> from many, many years ago. Tw- 2050, 
And uh, I'm the 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 last bit of it is I'm blanking on at the moment, but it was a, a graphic novel comic book that you worked on. Yeah. Um, so it was called 2052, The Yante Protocol. Yes. Um, so this was a comic book that you wrote? Yeah, I did it in, I did it during my master's and uh, I wanted to, I was like, I'm just going to be special and cool. And that was how I was presenting my work. Um, so instead of just putting up like architectural drawings and renders, uh, I worked with this artist and we built a comic book that just like explains the whole project and like why it was designed. Um, oh, it was a comic book about architecture. Right? Yeah, about like his, tangentially. About his masters, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was so, about you getting your architecture masters? No, it's it's it's. <laughs> this sounds like confusing. boring. Yeah, very I know. Boring it was. Book. I mean, it was kind of dry. Um, <laughs> so it's set in the year uh, 2052. And it's like very grounded. And so the graphic novel talks about uh, like what happens like post resource wars, what happens when like sea levels have risen to the point where there's like barely any land. How do we live? Like, what does that world look like? So it was supposed to be like, oh, here's probably what's going to happen if we don't change anything in the last next 10 years. Oh, Actually, I think we've got okay. 12 years left. That's now. awesome. And your your building that you worked on is Super is a part comic. of the comic, right? Yeah. And then are is in the comic is it following characters who are living within that building? Yeah. yeah oh. So it's um I still I've written chapter 2 and 3, we never released it and I probably will get around to it at some point, but uh, chapter one follows um, this guy called Eric, and it's about him, like living through the resource wars at the beginning, and like seeing everything changing around him, and then him working with a group of people to come up with like a future-proof way of living, and then it ends with him like on his deathbed, like living in this building, mm. and then chapter two and three we're gonna be um, just other characters living in the building and like talking about different ways that people live in these superstructures. Cool. Now, I had a question that, that came to mind while I was watching this and while I was watching some other videos of you, which, you know, you talk a lot about collaboration. Like, collaboration seems to be at the core. Like, I don't know. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but, um, but uh, you know, it seems to be something that you like to talk about, especially when it comes to the talks with Fusion 360 and how collaborative it is. And I'm wondering if this project with this comic book artist was sort of like a turning point in in this idea of collaborating with people outside of the discipline or oh totally yeah um i think architecture kind of like ingrains that in you in school because like no one person can design a skyscraper right, right. Like, you have to work in massive teams and you're not just working with designers like you're talking to civil engineers and oh oh no what <laughs> James is a very important man. We, uh, <laughs> James got a call on his phone, oh. but his phone's recording the YouTube podcast, so I think we we'll have just to. Cut out. Yeah, we we'll have to recut the video. Oh man, this is gonna be a tough episode to edit. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Should we give you some great poses when we cut back in? This is awful. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Technical difficulties. You know, when you get when you get three people in a room, things start going crazy. I know, right? Yeah. Um, Let's. All right, and we're back. Okay, James James is recording now, again, on the YouTube. But for those just listening, I guess, I mean, I don't know if we're going to cut this out or not, but... <laughs> Something crazy, a bear, like, burst through the wall. Yeah. Yeah. James, James had to get up and fight. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's amazing that I didn't get a scratch on me, but that's just how uh, agile I am. He's it's just so baller. <laughs> oh, man. But we were talking about, um, we we're talking about collaboration and collaboration in school as an architect. and Yeah, it... Um... Like, I constantly bang that drum because I still think that's the way that the best stuff is made. Because every time, like, so I sit in a team today where I'm the only industrial designer and everyone else is a mechanical engineer. We have an electrical engineer and an automotive designer. So everyone's got a different point of view. And when you can bring that all together, I feel like you just end up with better stuff mm -hmm, because yeah. you've considered all these different... It, and uh, everyone's... Everyone's skills complement each other. Oh, totally. Which yeah. I think is key because if you had a, a whole room full of industrial designers, I don't know if you can get the the best quality work. Mm. It'd look amazing though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, wouldn't function. Yeah. Have you learned any tricks over the years of maybe not tricks but tactics or just ways of of collaborating? Like, you know, have you found 
a good way to collaborate with people outside of the discipline where you're respecting each other's opinions, but also getting the best work out of everybody. And this is something that you're going to do a workshop on too, right? You just mentioned your Core 77 workshops kind of like... Yeah, so so the they're all kind of interconnected. Like the the reason we're doing the workshop is... Um, so I'm doing it with my buddy uh, Joe Mearsman, who's um, director of design at IBM. And both like through a corporate environment and then freelancing before that or running our own companies, like we've seen it like a lot, like probably more than most people because we just end up having to pull loads of different people into projects. Um, and so we both had to learn the hard way. Like I've had a lot of, can we swear on this? <laughs> if you want, it's all good. Yeah, we've had a few like fuck you motherfucker moments um, talking to engineering teams or like even with clients and um, it doesn't work and it's not helpful. Right. Um, and so... A lot of it comes down to just like being able to uh, like empathize and try to hear the other person's perspective. And actually what I found worked the best in terms of helping me um, with mechanical engineers, like I went and bought a bunch of mechanical engineering textbooks and started reading them. Like I don't understand 90% of it. I don't have to, but like I know enough that like I can hold a conversation and so if they're like, oh, are we using 6061 or 303 whatever aluminium, I at least know a little bit. Can we just so... rewind for a second? <laughs> Say that again. 6061 or 3034 aluminium. Aluminium. Mm. Don't yeah. you love it? Yeah. I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> aluminium. Um, yeah, there's um, so like being able to understand the language and the perspective that that person comes from doesn't take a lot of work. It's just getting like the tiniest amount of uh, understanding of their perspective and how they approach things. Um, and then it sounds really silly, but actually like the way you dress, like mm. I dress differently oh. when I go into a room full of mechanical engineers than right. if I'm hanging out with designers. Like so, you so, don't wear a beret. No, or... I'm not smoking a cigarette out of a really long holder <laughs> talking about, you know, how design is dead and, you know, it's all postmodern now. Uh, no one understands me. So, uh, so so, so how do you dress then? You like, just dress. Yeah, up. I mean, it's. I'm not talking about major differences, but like, if I'm with industrial designers, I dress like I do. So right. just like pretty casual. If I'm going to a room full of engineers, like I'm going to smarten up a bit because you're, you're tucking like, your shirt. Tucking the shirt sometimes. Interesting. Sometimes. Okay. Uh, Take a quick trip to Macy's. Yeah. Get the pocket protector thing. Yeah. Powder blue short sleeve <laughs> shirt with a tie. All right. Now I'm just making fun. I'm sorry to any engineer who's listening. They don't listen. <laughs> and if you are, turn this podcast off now. No, it's it's okay. not for you. <laughs> listen, I invite the engineers to listen. It's okay, guys. You dress differently when you come and listen to our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's an interesting technique. Huh. I it, feel like engineers have gotten a little bit hipper over the years. I've met a lot of engineers that'll like longboard to work, and hmm. I don't know. They're I mean, getting cooler. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're learning from us. I know, I, right? I can't believe you read engineering books. I don't think I could get through the first page of an engineering book. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of pictures, which really okay. helps. I can do pictures. <laughs> well, whenever I'm reading to Nick while he's in bed, he falls asleep in like minutes. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. engineering book will put you right to sleep. <laughs> Who doesn't love learning about boring bits? <laughs> like literally, but you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess like I would I would want that I would want that knowledge to have that like ha moment like no <laughs> no I know that you're lying. I've done that once. Oh. It was pretty satisfying, <laughs> but you look like a jerk. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Um well, so Paul, you said you were in architecture and then I I saw on your LinkedIn that you got a PhD. In... I'm still working on it, yeah. Okay, so you're still working on your PhD from RCA? Yeah. Royal College of Art, which is a one of the world's best schools for design, mm -hmm. um, from from what I know. Yeah. And how is that going? Yeah, that seems I, like I, a... I snuck in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you snuck in. I'd like it, so there's this misconception that PhDs are these like huge grand undertakings and all-encompassing and yeah they are like if you do a scientific one but like a design-based PhD is put it this way I'm writing a paper right now called why mannequins don't have genitals like I'm not kidding that is exactly what the paper is called <laughs> is that is what thesis? it's gonna get no oh, okay. um, part of the class. Okay. so the PhD is around um, uh, 3d printing technology applications for museums 
And I'm looking specifically at like how you build uh, mannequins to display historic dress because everything was tailor made. Mm. So you can't just put it on a regular mannequin because it looks weird. Right. Um, so. And why don't they have genitals? Uh, there's actually no rhyme or reason to it. Oh. Um, so putting nipples on is just basically up to whoever's designing the mannequin and <laughs> museums will put like little rolled up socks to simulate a penis. Wow. Um, cause is like, it accurate to the time period? They're very small. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh man. But yeah, it's like, cause all of that is about, um, representation and so it's this like it's a for, to me it's really interesting because you're looking at you're trying to approach it as a design problem, but a museum is like just the facts. Yeah. So anything that's like flair is eliminated, mm. and every museum is different. And so it's this really interesting challenge. And what I've come up with is um, uh, it's a script, and you can like measure a piece of clothing, and it builds the torso of the person who wore it. Which wow. only, but it only works until about like 1950s, because then like standard clothing came into style right. huh. and uh, people started wearing looser fitting stuff. But most of like pretty much everything for the last 500 years before that point was pretty form fitting and tailor made to you. So it's relatively easy to figure out what the person looked like who That's wore it. Interesting. So you can put in the measurements of the shirt, like the shirt is you know, 20 inches tall or whatever, and then it builds... Yeah, basically, yeah. The Is it 3D model, I assume? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I haven't decided if I'm 3D printing them or CNC milling, because there's this whole extra bit about um, making sure you don't damage anything and Mm. making sure it's not a material that'll, like, react to the clothing over time. Uh, Okay. Um, And would plastic react with the museum clothing? uh, Some of them do. Um, weirdly, PLA is actually fine as long as it doesn't have any dyes in it. Okay. So if you just get natural PLA, it works pretty well, but they will panic because it's polylactic acid. And they're like, sorry, what, you want to put acid on your <laughs> 400-year-old clothes? <laughs> well, yeah, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, and that, like, as, like, a position of, like, talking about collaboration, um, museums are so behind the times when it comes to modernizing themselves like using new techniques they barely do anything digital Mm. so like i'm constantly having conversations with people who have like no idea what position i'm coming from or Mm. how i'm trying to change stuff and i deal with resistance all the time they're like what is a 3d printer basically (laughs) yeah what is a computer um i'm like museum guys not you don't have to live like it's 200 years ago. You so, want to be on display. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is we need to put those museums in museums and then modernize. We, we could put them all in the new museum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They love their postmodern shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you working with any museums in particular? Yeah, the uh, Victorian Albert Museum okay. in, in London. Okay. Strongly recommend it. If you're a designer, you should go check it out. Have you ever been um, to London? Yes, actually, I, a couple times. I have never been to London. Really? No, it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I want to visit. Just don't go London. in January. Okay. Like we don't get sun. That's well, I thought, why we're I all so you never chipper. got sun any any days. Yeah, two thirds of our weather is overcast. Mm. That's why we're all such happy, fun people. <laughs> um, there's actually like some fun fact. There is a national epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in the UK because uh, of how little sun we get. Right. <laughs> So do you guys have to take supplements or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does vi- milk have vitamin D? Uh, we all just take pills, basically. Okay. Just like <laughs> by the fistful. I like, I like if you milk. go, if you go to London, you just see common the common person walking around with a jug of milk. Basically, yeah. <laughs> just taking swigs. It's for my vitamin D. Uh, You're not but, wrong. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny. My my wife was pointing out. Um, the, the lead singer of churches because my wife is very interested in like keeping her skin keeping her skin nice okay and she pointed out the lead singer of churches looking like she's like 13 even though she's I think maybe in her 30s or something but because Scotland probably gets like no sunlight whatsoever her skin is just like flawless because there's no sun damage oh yeah is that how it works I mean it is there's also no air conditioning which mm. I still, like, I've been living in the U.S. for 10 months, and I still every morning have to, like, 
brush my forehead basically <laughs> to get all the like dried up skin from AC. And I'm like, I didn't have this problem in the UK. This oh, is weird. Right. Turns out it's air conditioning. Huh. Yeah. Moisturizing bills are through the roof. <laughs> But uh, but you don't have to drink as much milk anymore. That's <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. the trade off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, so you were working. You started this company 2052 or 2052. Two, you yeah, we were you real sticklers. Yeah, we were real sticklers did, about that. When, like, were you like when you came up with the name? Did did you draw from the comic intentionally? Was that an idea? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, my business partner uh, Claudio, he and I met. Um, just by like running in the same circles and we were always at the same conferences like we ended up having a lot of like crossover clients and um, so when we started the company I told him about the comic book and that whatever we did together because we still weren't sure what we were going to do I wanted to always like keep that in the back of our mind that like let's try to build stuff that is working against that culture and like over consumerizing mm. that's not a word but I, I'm going to roll with it mm-hmm. um yeah, and I'm actually trying to do something uh, similar again. Uh, not that I'm trying to plug myself, but if anyone's interested, and this, wants is to work on it, yeah. right. this is your chance. Yeah, all right. This is your chance. We're plugging you in. So uh, a friend of mine and I are um, like these super early days, but we're setting something up that we're going to call "This Is Enough," mm. and it's going to be um, uh, we're starting with a design bible. So we're going to open source a bunch of products that we're going to design ourselves. And then the Bible will go through like the principles we use to design this, material choices, um, and then like the philosophy behind the whole thing. Like cool. we're, we're looking at like how much money is like enough money, like how much space is enough space um, for like one person, a couple, like a small family, and then put that out as like an ethos to try and follow, and then build products that you can purchase that follow that line. Mm. But I just described best made, I think. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's like it's something that plays on my mind a lot is just like, yeah, the UN says we've got 12 years of living like this before we're all screwed. Um, 2052 is the year where uh, we're projected to have 10 and, between 10 and 11 billion people. And based on the way that we live today, like it's just not sustainable. Like we're coming to the cap at like how many people can live the way that we live now before we're all screwed. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's that was the point of the company name i don't know if we actually really did that i mean Mm -hmm. we made a lot of weird stuff like (laughs) reverse death masks and 3d printers which what is a reverse death mask (laughs) so this um this client uh he like he was ill a lot and he like explained to us that he suffers from like this whole multitude of, of illnesses and he could just like drop at any point um, and he wanted to, like, he was pretty goth. So just to contextualize this, okay. um, he wanted when he passed away to have, um, his like skull as a mask that he wore and then the inside of the mask to be his actual face. Mm. Um, so he like gave us a CT scan data that we like managed to pull his skull out of. And so it's like his skull on the outside and then on the inside is a 3d scan of his actual face. So I don't know what he wanted to do. I don't know if he's still kicking around. Um, he might be, but like I don't know what happens with that afterwards. Like, did he decide huh. to get buried with it? Huh. Or? So does that is that because he wants them, like people in the future, to be able to dig him up and recreate his face? I have no idea. We didn't really <laughs> ask questions. We were like, okay, <laughs> we, we pay, really need us. rent money this month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Um, yeah, were there any, were there any, like, big projects to come out of this that, like, you, you know, you'd like to discuss other than death masks? <laughs> uh, I mean, most of what we did at two zero, like, we still can't talk about it. Oh. Um, but it evolved into, um, like, so that's how I got into Autodesk. Um, so we were super early adopters of Fusion 360. Mm. Um, it made a lot of sense for us because we were a two person team and we just like constantly expanded to collaborate with other people. And so, so that's why we used it. Um, and so like Autodesk, like we caught their attention. We just started having a lot of conversations. They, um, they paid to take us out to Autodesk university, which is probably best described as a drinking club with a CAD problem. Um, <laughs> so I had an absolute blast. 
Um, and then, yeah, just like that led to it, like the timing was great. Like the company was sort of like slowing down a bit. Um, my business partner went off to BAE Systems and then I joined Autodesk. Huh. Okay. I think he makes guns now. I don't know. I should check in with Interesting. Him. Death mask and guns. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got real dark. <laughs> Uh, wait, I, I want to go back to this Autodesk University. So they they sent you somewhere to what? To like get a boot camp through the software? Where, where or... is it? Where is it? Oh, it's um, it's this three-day event in Vegas, hence the drinking oh, club with the cat. I was really hoping wow. for like a 3D printed island <laughs> in the Pacific. Maybe next year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it'll be just like a giant Autodesk A. There's your, <laughs> there's your sustainability idea. You go to the Pacific... Uh, garbage patch. You rake up all that uh, garbage, and then uh, oh, I just spilled oh, that. oh no! <laughs> <laughs> you you know you you turn all that garbage into a three D printed island. Mm. You get more space for more people and no more garbage. Yeah, there Pla- you go. The I have a real piece. seagull problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so it was in Las Vegas. You said. And was it like a conference, like conference hall, boot camp? Like, what are we talking about yeah, here? Yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot that happens at AU. That's what the cool kids call it. Um, <laughs> so do you have a degree from AU? <laughs> I wish, no. Uh. Do I wish? I don't think I wish that. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, um, so there's tons of master classes that are mostly run by um, users. Mm. So people can submit classes every year and like, it covers everything, so... Uh, like classes in like 3ds max for video games like special effects and movies like architecture construction automotive manufacture blah, blah 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 so there's all these classes happening and then there's like loads of panel discussions we get um like some pretty cool keynote speakers every day um and then there's just like hundreds of activities and mm-hmm. the so best part is always the video game section oh yeah yeah <laughs> So it's more like a conference or a trade show type of thing. Yeah, it's like it, the reason it's got the name Autodesk University is because of like there are so many classes and like right, the right. majority of people who attend that's why they're going is they want to get like just like super condensed ultra hardcore training in three days. Yeah, got it, got it. Wait, so did Autodesk send you there before like they brought you on for your position or how did that work out? Yeah, I came out um I came out as a customer. Um, so I was, we, the company I ran, we were running it out of, um, a co-working space in London called Makerversity, mm. um, which is, if you go to London, you should You've definitely go check them out. I've gone to a lot of colleges. Makerversity. <laughs> Makerversity. <laughs> Autodesk University. University <laughs> Royal College of Art. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. yeah. University of Hard Knocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, Makerversity was just setting up a program called Makerversity DIY, which was to help um, kind of pick up where STEM and STEAM was being let down in education. Because um, um, I'm pretty sure it's the same here in the US. Like they're constantly cutting those budgets. Mm. And it's like a, a wood shop is an expensive thing to run. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so we were designing these chair, uh, sorry, this, uh, this workbench that students could put together, which was made of just like, um, square section dowel and plywood tops and then 3d printed sections. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's how I got invited because I was working on that project. Um, yeah. And then I just, apparently they were really impressed at like how many times I got blackout drunk and <laughs> offered, <laughs> offered me a job. Um, so yeah, I've been with Autodesk, uh, since 2015. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, working as an industrial designer there. It's it, a very meandering. Well, uh, now I know you said you're, you are not a f- huge in 360 evangelist anymore, yeah. but it says that on your LinkedIn. And I was just kind of curious, what is that exactly? <laughs> fusion 360 evangelist? Um, it's, it's a really misleading name. Okay. Um, but basically, we would uh, so we would like create loads of learning content for YouTube. We ran like workshops um, like all over the world, um, like tons of meetups to like build a community. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would also do a lot of um, like partnership projects. So like, oh, if there's a startup that's like working on something really cool, then we would just embed ourselves in their team mm-hmm. um, to help them deliver that. So it didn't cost them anything. Like. It was really cool for us because we got a really cool story to tell about like a really amazing innovative product um and then yeah so that that's how i got started um and that was the role i was like hybridized to be um an industrial designer too because i was running these like 
um, direct design projects. Mm -hmm. And then just like over time, the evangelism is sort of like faded away and I just focus on like project based work now, which is really fun. Okay. So, I mean, from what I remember, you recently did this skateboard project, which kind of seems like if you're an evangelist, you would kind of help some designer build the skateboard but now since you are the industrial designer you actually built this skateboard truck is that kind of how it works yeah okay yeah so that's um <laughs> I mean, that project's not particularly typical of like how we work but um do you know right over there buddy <laughs> it's only the second class <laughs> james's um, mic cover just fell down it's okay <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so like we have this new technology called generative design and um, we wanted to like figure out a way to show how it works in the real world. And so at first everyone's like, why don't we make a car or like a yacht? I'm like, <laughs> do you have $2 million I don't know yeah, about? That's a and lot. That's a big <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it was like a two birds <laughs> with one stone thing. Of, we wanted to show that like I still to this day hear that uh, like 3D printing is weak and it's kind of crap and flimsy and that's fair if like most people's exposure has been desktop machines yeah um, which is still great by the way like I'm not taking a dump on them I think they're a really valuable part of like prototyping um, so yeah we wanted to show that like metal printing is crazy strong and we could build something super lightweight um, and I just have like a huge passion for skateboarding so it was just a really easy way of showing that yeah I, I thought that was an interesting product it was like a skateboard truck 3D printed out of titanium? I think it was titanium. Yep. Yeah. Which is crazy. How much did that cost? Can you dollars. Um, <laughs> it, it was, yeah. No, it's, um, so we made two versions. We made titanium ones and aluminium ones. The titanium ones were $1,300 each. Okay. Which is a lot. Um, I was actually um, expecting more. So I, You could something. probably do it for less, actually. Like We um, we worked with Shoutout to Shapeways, by the way. We worked with them uh, to like get that project done. Um and then the aluminium ones are like 300 or 350 each, okay. and considerably cheaper. Um, but we're going to follow up because um, Braille actually put out a second video with the aluminium skate trucks, which I specifically asked them not to skate and record, but um, they survived. Like the reason we didn't want them to do it is we didn't get a chance to like test them and check uh, that they were okay. actually safe okay. for use. Right. Um, I hope no one from legal is listening. <laughs> um. Do lawyers listen to this podcast? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, oh, it's boy. New York. Oh, it's yeah. Be... <laughs> People sit around in conferences and just, just. oh, man, we're going to get them there. <laughs> they're, 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 they're drafting up the cease and desist. Yeah. And we're, we're done for. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I was watching the video uh, on YouTube of you going through the process of designing the trucks today. And it was interesting to me because I've never done anything in generative design. But, you know, you were essentially, it seemed like you were setting up parameters uh, for this CAD to generate itself? Is that... Yeah, it's... Um, I find industrial designers, like, pick it up way quicker than mechanical engineers, mm. although it does require some engineering knowledge. Um, so the way it works is, like... Um, so there are two ways of using it, which are, and I like to refer to them as, like, optimization or abstraction. And optimization is, like, oh, I design a thing... And I want to optimize it so right. I can run it through generative design and see where all my superfluous material is and work around that. And it creates um, like holes in like more organic structures based yeah. on that algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, um, if you run it as an optimization, it's kind of taking what you have and subtracting away from it until okay. you've got. So it's very similar to topology optimization in that respect, um, which is basically what topology optimization does. Um, the abstraction version, which is like how I made the skate trucks, is you're mostly modeling the negative space mm. and then you apply load cases to it so it knows what kind of forces it's dealing with and then it generates geometry for you. Oh, yeah. so, um, so, for, so what you would do is you would model like where the wheels go, yeah. where the skateboard goes, where it attaches, and then say, all right, computer, now figure out the thing in between all that. Yes, oh, yeah. okay. Um, so with like a skateboard... Um, that was like a really easy way to help, particularly those who don't have an engineering background, understand how it would work. So mm -hmm. um, like load cases, basically, it just means like scenarios. So with like a skateboard, you have four scenarios. Like you're just cruising, you're leaning left, you're leaning right, or you're like hitting the ground suddenly from landing a trick. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you basically tell it what sort of forces happen in those scenarios. And then it figures out 
what uh, what the shape is going to look like. And it's also like, so it factors in the, the material um, and the way that you're going to make it too. So you can tell it like, oh, I'm going to 3D print this or I'm going to CNC mill this and then eventually like casting or injection molding and stuff like that. Oh, that's in- So if you said, I'm going to CNC this, it would come out with a different... Yeah, yeah, you get a pretty different looking thing. Oh, okay. Hmm. And what about the the scenario where they're grinding on the trucks? Is that also a factor? Like a like a 50/50 grind? Yeah. Um it's sort of like that that is um basically like you get the result from the sudden impact. Mm. Um it just ends up being like sustained. Yeah. Um so part of the reason we picked titanium is um like I knew I wanted to work with Braille, um, and we made them first, and then we reached out to skate companies, which is probably the what is Braille? Big. Sorry. Oh yeah, uh, so Braille skateboarding. Um, they're a team out in the Bay Area, and they started out by uh, this guy named Aaron Kiro, who was like posting uh, his like skate videos to YouTube, which is like where skate videos would go to die back in the day. Um, but it started to pick up steam and he built a community around that. And the reason they named it Braille is that it literally means to rise up. Hmm. Um, and they're all about just like a super inclusive experience. They do like classes, like skateboarding made simple. And so I really wanted to work with them. Um, and also cause they have this series called you make it, we skate it. And like 90% of the oh, stuff people right. send them is just destroyed. Nice. Um, which by the way, if anyone listening to this is going to check it out, definitely watch the tempered glass skateboard. Did I it, won't. Did it break? Oh, you're gonna spoil it. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a few of those videos. They're crazy. Yeah, they're like skating glass skateboards, or like I've seen them like do plastic wheels or glass wheels. Like, yeah, they people send them crazy skateboards, crazy stuff. Pool board wheels, uh, Thor's hammer. They've had <laughs> um, oh they a had door. I, I remember seeing a door. Like a door. Yeah, they skated a, a full size door. Nice. They just skated a Tesla Model S door. Oh, whoa. Car door. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, they've had some pretty gross ones. They've had the human hairboard, um, the human teeth skateboard. Yeah. I would like to see them skate Elon Musk. No. <laughs> what? Tray flip Musk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so you got to um, collaborate with them. That's pretty cool. You, you, so you brought your trucks out to San Francisco. Yeah. Um, we reached out to them and just were like, hey, we made these and we would love to like bring them out for a video. And so we did a we did a sponsored video with them, and yeah, I mean, we knew relatively confidently that they weren't going to break. Um, so we basically set them the challenge of like, "Would well, you guys are making a video? Like, do your best, like try and break them because I don't think you can." Um, and they didn't, which was awesome. And also, mm. it's because they're titanium. Like, <laughs> you'd have to have like a four hundred pound gorilla pro skater to break that. <laughs> Probably, I don't know, maybe, or just like a Kodiak bear on a board. <laughs> I would watch that. I'm just yeah. saying, like, I would watch a Kodiak bear skate. Um, well, that's cool. So. And the the video's online. You can check it out, right? It's on the yeah, yeah, yeah. skateboarding. Yeah. Uh, you just type in, like, 3D. I'm pretty sure if you just put in 3D printed titanium into YouTube now, it's, like, one of the first hits. You yeah. don't even have to finish it out with skateboard. Okay. Well, we'll definitely link it to, link it on our website. Yeah. Well, I have a question. It's just a general question. Uh, what is it about... Like, I feel like skateboarding is very much, like, becoming this, uh, I don't know. Like, people are finding finding the skateboarding videos more and more, I feel like, now through Instagram. Yeah. There's, like, sort of a general interest in it. What is it about it, it, skateboarding that we all love and it's so gonna, much? It's going to be in the Olympics, which is another big... Oh, big right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Tokyo 2020. First time skateboarding is going to be in the Olympics. That's amazing. But, yeah, what is it about it that we all love? Do you Do you have an answer? I think it's freedom of expression. Yeah. I, I also right? think, I mean, you just wrote up here with your booster board too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't know what it is. I think there's something cool about, I mean, specifically for designers, I think it's a designed object and it's very functional. It feels very but also, optimized, but also designed yeah, object. Yeah. yeah. Optimized and beautiful in its optimization. Yeah. In a way, you know? Yeah. It's super cool. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Cause like they all look kind of the same when you just look at them, but then you, you stand on them and you can feel the difference between the brands. Like it's like super subtle changes in the contouring mm. that make these like huge differences to how it feels. And that is just, yeah, like you said, it's something I, I really geek out on. Yeah. Like yeah. How, how is that feels so different? It's like two, three millimeters out. Yeah. Sorry, I use a metric system. 
They send did. guys get into well, it. Well, no, yeah. we <laughs> listen. We love the metric system. Oh Design, yeah, designers everywhere love the metric system. Yeah, we're just sad that we live in America and just. <laughs> I mean, most inches of the... and feet and what. Most of the jobs that I've done, I've had to measure in, in metric. Yeah, I, I've yeah. never okay. done like yeah. inches or anything. Yeah. Huh. I guess I spend too much time around engineers. <laughs> they will give me a hard time about it. So one of the, I don't know if I should be admitting this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, one of the machine shop guys, like I've been messing with him and very slowly switching his tools out for metric ones. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. If and he hasn't noticed yet. <laughs> machine shop and woodworkers. Those are the people that really use the, the U S mm, system because yeah. that's all the tools are made in inches and feet, you know? Mm. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. But they, I don't know. Yeah. I just, I, I appreciate the metric system for just like the logical consistency of the whole system. So nice. Like it just... I mean, like, you know, to be measuring in quarter inches and half inches and... <laughs> Don't get to, like, 30 seconds or 64. You know, yeah. You'll be dead. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I think, like, from what I've taken from skateboarding culture is, like, like, there is an immediate so there's like sort of creativity that's being an expression that's that's being on that's on display but there's also the real like the risk that is so imminent mm. like and and it's like because in our day-to-day -day lives when we're doing things like creating creating new things that that risk or that you know the risk of failure like you were you were afraid of like the trucks breaking basically mm. but the skateboarders are afraid of their bodies breaking but like <laughs> the the gap of time between when like you have created the thing to when you're actually testing whether it's going to fail or not is is so much longer than their small gap of time that they oh right split second <laughs> split second between you landing that awesome trick and busting your head open i have broken both of my ankles because of that oh damn. really um, yeah oh yeah yeah both of my ankles are um, at the same matted. time no i didn't learn my lesson the first time around <laughs> okay. uh so i broke my left ankle when i was 18 and then my right ankle when i was 22 and the second time around i was it was like right before christmas and i was too scared to tell my dad because i knew he was gonna be mad oh. so i texted him instead of like in hospital broke ankle lol and um all i got back with three words which are just you not even spelled out just you deserve it and i'm like yeah that's fair <laughs> oh man oh, that was my... pretty brutal well you have the new boosted board now have you fallen on that thing yet I've I fell a few times okay. um, when boosted I had mini. the. Is it called the mini? What's yeah. The so board? I have the mini and I I um I have the longboard too. Um, the mini is like super convenient just because it's like compact. I think it's also just like a nicer looking design. Okay. Um, I fell on the longboard a few times uh, at the beginning, but that was especially like the first time because. I took it out of the box and I'm like, I've been skating for 10 years. I'm just going to put this in pro <laughs> mode. It'll be fine. Oh, no. And like immediately ate shit. Just Damn. like immediately. Um, How fast can you go on those things? Uh, top speed for the longboard is 22 miles an hour. That's really fast. And the mini's 18. Okay. So, I mean, four miles is a difference when you're still like yeah. holding on by the seat of your pants. You don't really care. Mm. Um, but yeah, as a way of getting around, great. It feels kind of fun. Um there is that, like, there's a different risk factor with a boosted board of just like, right. oh, God, Boston drivers, please don't hit me. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and car doors opening. I've like, never been doored. Oh. I've come close. Okay. Yeah. I've had friends that have been doored on their bikes, and it's I just, no, thank you. So bad. I don't bike around New York. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a big guy. I feel like you just power through the door and keep going. <laughs> Big guy, soft tissue. Soft uh, tissue. Yeah, that's fair. Soft tissue. I don't know. And also, like, my limbs can sort of, like, flail in all sorts of different directions. So I can, like, you know, I would, like, catch my arm doing yeah. something weird. You got long arms, long legs. Those things will whip really quick, you know. <laughs> snap, snap a few fingers right off. Yeah. Like, stress... one of those, like, army men that you would stick on the wall and they just... <laughs> The stress test on me would not last very long. Or, yeah, Need minimal some of that stress. Generative design on your body. <laughs> yeah, can you design a suit for me? Some sort of suit of armor oh, that's man. lightweight but can, you know, handle all the stresses of day to day life. Sure, sure. Pummeling, yeah. Day to day pummeling. So, so Paul, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about this generative design. This, I don't know how much experience you have with AI. Mm. I mean, I think generative design kind of has. It's kind of a cousin to artificial intelligence in a way, in my yeah. mind. 
Yeah, it, least, it runs as like very deep algorithms today. Okay. And I'm pretty sure we'll give it like another year or two, it'll be like full blown AI. Okay, so so in a year or two, you won't even have to build the algorithms? Or how? To, how? <laughs> no, you still need the algorithm for sure. Like the math still has to be uh, like verified and set up by a human being in the first place. Mm, okay. Because um, AI is still like, in terms of it's, it's not going to take over a designer's job anytime soon. And I can almost, I've said it out loud now and I know in like a year's time I'm going to be like fired because AI has taken over <laughs> reading a newspaper being like, damn it. Um, but yeah, it just like, it doesn't understand intent. So mm. you can't use it to design. Like um, it doesn't understand intent now or in a few years i don't i, th- do I you think, think it'll take a while you think it'll take a while yeah i don't i don't want to get too like oh thank god meta about it but i do feel like design comes from the soul or whatever mm. word you want to use in place right um so trying to um trying to quantify it doesn't make sense like jeff bezos wants to he set up that shoe i don't know if he's done it yet but they said amazon's going to set up a shoe brand because they have all this data on like what sneakers sell and don't sell. But I'm right. like, okay, but your pool of information is people who buy sneakers from Amazon. <laughs> so <laughs> like that's weird. And then also you can only build something that way that can it's only gonna be able to design stuff based on what's happened before. AI can't have like a like moment of inspiration. Well, right? y- you think about fashion trends though, I mean they are s- sort of cipl- cyclical in a way. To you some think, degree, you yeah. think AI could learn fashion trends and then predict fashion trends? Uh, I think you could predict trends, but it wouldn't be down to the like, all right, these are the materials to pick and like, mm-hmm. here's the style to choose. It'll be yeah. more like kind of informational, anecdotal. I, I, yeah, I kind of see what you're saying. Like the Amazon shoe is going to look very generic in a way. Yeah. It's and it fit all the check boxes. Because mm. that's what the parameters are. It's like, oh, here's all the top selling shoes. Let's mash them all together. Yeah. All I know is it's, they're not going to make it in my size. <laughs> and I'm sorry, James. Yeah, I'm angry. They're 14? 15. Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it could it could possibly predict trends, but it can't, like, whenever there's a, I mean, this is coming from somebody with very little of knowledge in the fashion industry, but... I will say that for whatever trend there is, there's also like an equal and opposite trend that is born out of the era that how could you possibly predict maybe? Like there's, yeah. you know, there's not just one general trend. There's usually like a couple battling trends. Or... Yeah, you think about like punk. Like that was, I don't think that was a cyclical thing. That was like a thing that just rose out of, I don't know, the fashion world. Right. And, it, I, and music it, too. It's kind of the same for design. To some degree, like design is kind of evolutionary, but and it has a cyclical moments. Johnny Ive, um, but <laughs> shout out Hector. Um... Wait, 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 now Paul, are you a are you a Johnny Ive hater? Cause, no, I'm cause not. It's gonna be two against one now. Uh, I'm not a hater. I'm not even a hater. I just, I just think he should be held accountable for the notch. I know. I know. Really don't care. Hey, can what we the... St- the Google Pixel notch is oh, obscene. I yeah, know... I could park a coffee table on that. Has, <laughs> has anybody brought up the point that the Google Pixel notch is exactly a Google Chrome tab? Oh like my literally god. Oh my god. Down? I don't god. think anybody has brought this up yet. I can't unsee that. Look, wow. that wow. is the Google notch wow. right there. Yeah, the just, tab. Wow, I can't. Wow. That's, yeah. You're welcome, yeah. America, and <laughs> whoever else is listening out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I think it's pretty obscene. But I think all notches are obscene. Yeah, that's like which one of these ugly people do you find the ugliest? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's a it's a lose lose situation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it just it just the notch just makes me sad. Yeah, like, that's the thing that like it's cool that Apple is so influential that people are like unnecessarily copying them right um but just why do you think do you think john do you think johnny i've walks into the meeting with that in mind he's like listen this let's, is the compromise we off. have to make let's but here's the off. thing everybody else is gonna do it because we're apple damn it and then they walk out of the conference room meeting adjourned <laughs> it's it's a it's it's a distraction they're apple's apple already could have done the full screen but they're like you know what we're gonna do 
<laughs> Put a notch in there. Throw everyone off. Make yeah. Everyone oh, yeah. Without qu- you know the you know the um, iOS UI was designed in like the mid eighties. It's crazy. Really? Yeah. It, it was like the research teams like have this much runway where they try to figure out stuff and then wait for technology to catch up. Oh, yeah. I can see that. It's yeah. It's wild. Like the notches, they probably designed that like six years ago mm. and there's probably i mean there are notchless designs like samsung figured that out right um they just push the camera as far to the top as they can right yeah with, with the samsung phone and then there's all these sort of like phones that are coming out that are sort of gimmicky that like the the camera pops up yeah or they're like the screen i really slides. want that yeah. one though <laughs> just because it looks cool yeah <laughs> Yeah, which one? Which one are you referring to? I, I there's like a purplish one that kind of like the back slides, but then there's also one that just like a little tab. I'm thinking of the one with the little tab, yeah. just because it's it's so terrible, it's adorable. Yeah, like it's motorized; it doesn't even pop out. It's just like it seems like a James Bond. Like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or just like a post-apocalyptic. <laughs> Like future FaceTime camera. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like something you would see in like the first Alien movie. You, you know, here's an interesting thing I saw recently. Facebook released their uh, Skype thing, Skype setup, like iPad thing. Did you guys see that? Oh, yes, no, I, I think I that. did. It's... <laughs> the good thing that's empty. Uh, <laughs> let me open one of these Google tab notches. Um... So, yeah, Facebook released a standalone product with a screen on it that sits in your living room and it it's essentially just a FaceTime or Skype interface. Um, I forget what it's called, but essentially... A video phone. Yeah, a video it's phone. It's like a 90s video phone. <laughs> yeah, and it has a special camera on it that tracks you when you walk around the room. But the interesting thing that I saw was that they actually have a piece of plastic that you can cover the camera with. Oh, mm. the, interesting. It's called like a privacy so, privacy lid or something, and it's like on the actual product. It was designed for the product, and it yeah, it just sits on top of the camera. I am. By the way, I'm I'm proving how awful I am at, at Google searches. Do you like I'm trying to find this thing? Facebook new product or something? <laughs> new product? <laughs> oh no. The old new product. Oh, man. Uh, Facebook camera FaceTime. table. <laughs> Facebook's listening to us right now. Yes. And oh, there it is. FaceTime portal. Oh, yes. It's called the portal. Mm-hmm. That looks like the, the Amazon, exactly yeah. like the Amazon Echo thing. Yes. Yeah. So, like, Amazon has one and, you know, Google, I mean, Google will come out with one and Apple, I'm sure, whatever. But I thought it was just interesting that they designed a specific plastic piece that you can put over the camera, which in a way is, like, accepting that is it possible to spy through the camera i don't know that kind of made me a little anxious when i when i saw that oh yeah um that's probably for people like us like is it were they desi- and... yeah were, were they designing it for in, for our anxiety about cameras well, or were they I designing f- it because they actually know about it i feel like it's facebook being like see we're all about privacy like after <laughs> in the wake of everything <laughs> They're, you know, that's they're probably like, it. Yeah. We should make a plug for that camera. Wow. Put a plug on it. Huh. I don't even think I put a plug on it. I don't even think that's like a, a hacking anxiety thing. Yeah. I think that's for people who are like, I don't want, I'm going to buy this, but I don't want Facebook listening to me all the time. Right. But, but then just don't buy it. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting product. Now, Paul, I, we have a few more minutes left. I just want to hear kind of what you are. Are you working on any projects right now or anything you can tease us for the future? Um, I'm doing something automotive related. Mm. That is all I can okay. say. Is it um, the car that we're, our cars that we're going to race? Oh, man, I forgot about those. Yeah, yeah we got to <laughs> do that. Like, yeah, it's like a car project. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to race my, like, weird, sporty, couldn't fit a human being car. Yeah, yeah against are, my are, weird Noguchi car. <laughs> these are RC cars, too. Yes. Right. Mine right. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, mine has to be retrofitted. James is not real. No, it's not real. <laughs> none None of the things that I post are real, guys. Stop drawing on receipts, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, like... I guess a broader question is like, what are you excited? About? Like, what is getting you excited right now about yeah. design? Like, mm. just in general. Uh, it's same answer I gave two years ago at Core Seventy Seven Live, which is uh, MedTech. 
like there's a huge need for designers to enter that field and start to like there is something very unhuman and robotic about uh, the hospital experience mm. and like everything from like the sounds in the hospital to the products to the bed to the way things are done the experiences for patients like all of that needs um designers to come in and just be like can we add a touch of humanity to this right um and it's happening and it's really cool and then the other side is like it doesn't sound all that interesting but there's some really really cool stuff happening in agriculture mm. like designing for farms and huh, just like right. food farming um isn't elon musk's brother doing something with like vertical agriculture uh, i i i know he does i know, he does, I know he, he's a big ranch boy <laughs> yeah you know elon musk's brother's a ranch guy yeah so he maybe he might be working on some sort of um but what have you what what have you seen that's uh that's gotten you excited Ooh. um so there's a company in uh canada called synaptive who produce uh they're basically like robots that help with surgery and they spent tons and tons of time developing this like super awesome ux and um just incredible user experience for surgeons so and they just did what nobody else had done they went and spent tons of time talking to doctors and like speaking to the people who do this surgery and it's like well what do you need like how how can we help this how do we help save lives how do we make something that isn't getting in the way um and it just has this like incredible user interface like you can do stuff like set the robot up to run a routine or mm. um give you essentially like a super stable hand almost acting like a kind of gyro control for the trembles in your hands oh, for brain surgery that's cool um and another company out of uh canada called mayant who do uh smart textiles and so they've developed all these like really really cool smart textiles the founder set the company up because he wanted to um find a way basically to keep tabs on his father who was suffering from dementia at the time mm. Um, and he landed on wearable tech. And I was like, that's a super cool way of thinking about that. Because even someone who's like, with the exception of the worst sufferers of dementia, everyone, they still generally remember to put their clothes on. So trying to introduce something new, like a like an Apple Watch or something like that, isn't going to work. Mm. But just replacing something that's in their existing routine um, huh. is really, really fascinating. Um, so they developed a pair of underwear called Skin. Um, and it acts as like an ECG, an EEG, a pedometer. They have a little thing on it that can be used as a GPS tracker if you want to. Wow. Um, and so there's like fitness applications, there's like medical applications. Um, and I've never looked at a pair of underwear and gone, those are really cool before. But mm. this, I was like, those look really cool. I'd wear those. Nice. Huh. Right? You know, just I feel like we should bring underwear on the outside back. <laughs> Superman. -y. Wait, they fit on the outside? No, 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 no. no. Oh. <laughs> That's It'd be cool if they did, though. Yeah, I mean, those industries we don't really think about, or James and I certainly don't talk about those industries a good bit. No, and we we don't have much experience in that. But that it's awesome to hear that like designs infiltrating those fields for sure. Yeah, I think about I, I spe specifically think about UX UI product design in terms of healthcare and insurance and things. Like my insurance is Oscar, and I specifically got Oscar insurance because it's the only health insurance that's been designed. Oh, you know, they, yeah. Like, they had an app, you know, it's the it's the Uber for health insurance. Yeah. Hmm. So it was, like, so much easier than going on to, like, uh, you know, U.S. health insurance is, like, whatever. I, I have no clue how that stuff works. But Oscar was, like, just download the app and, you know, put in your phone number. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, do you ever... I, I find myself a sucker for, like, some nice, clean vector graphics. And mm. I'm like, yes, I will I will indulge in your services. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, yes. I, do, oh, I think services based on design, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Has it ever has, has it ever bitten you? Like, has it ever yep. come back to bite you? Has it? Which service? Uh, it's an online bank in the UK called... I want to say they're called Seam. I tried to, like, switch to an online-only bank that mm -hmm. uses an app. And you, as part of like the verification, you have to record a video of yourself holding your driver's license like a hostage <laughs> and like, like verify that like you are who you claim you are. And it took them like four weeks to get back to me. And I'm huh. like, dude, I like, I'm, I, I have like stacks of cash literally because I thought this was going to be like a two day process. What the hell? Yeah. yeah that, um, that, that was definitely a bad part on there. Yeah. yeah. But the, but the app was really pretty. 
Like, <laughs> so pretty. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm excited for the future for sure. And all these new technologies and generative design, artificial intelligence. I think, you know, it's it's going to be playing a huge role in the future. And we need to definitely start thinking about it now. But, uh, but yeah, thanks for coming on, Paul. Thanks for having me. Do you have any plugs you want to want to put out there? I mean, where can we find you on the uh, internet? You can find me on Instagram, uh, Fuse, P-S, F-U-S-E-P-S. Got it. Um, same on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Okay. I, have, I have like a digital meteor strike as opposed to a digital footprint. Um, yeah, and then uh, always looking for like people to collaborate with, just like... I got budget. <laughs> it's, it's basically like, and I need ways to spend it. So yeah. let's make cool shit together. Cool. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, and as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw on Receipts. All right. Peace out, guys. Later. Catch you later.